um, their text and illustrated books. This one here, The Greatest Liar on Earth, is in fact a true story. A true story of a, a person who told lots and lots of crazy stories many years ago that people didn't believe. They're actually stories that were told back in the 1800s by a fellow called Louis de Rougemont, who most people said was the greatest liar on earth. But many years after he'd finished telling his stories, people found out that many of them were true. So this is why we call it a true story as well. The guy said that it rained fish. He said that his canoe was attacked by a, a wild, evil monster with a, a sore beak. But in Australia, we know that there are these creatures, the sawfish, and we also know that it is a weather phenomenon that clouds go over the ocean and drag up fish from the ocean. And then when it travels over land, it does rain fish. So this is a story about really truth and what truth is. And so buried, I guess, deep in some of these books are, are also big themes. And the idea of what truth is, is, is a theme that would be something that maybe would be looked at by older children. So I like taking great stories from the past, including this one here, which is my brand new book, uh, The Drummer Boy of John John. This one is set in Trinidad. It's a story about a young boy who's not invited to carnival and he desperately wants to be part of a band. So he invents his own band. It's called a junkyard band. He uses pots and cans and tins and he gets his friends, they paint up the drums and they join the carnival parade in Trinidad. And eventually they win the big award for the carnival parade. But most people don't understand that this in fact is a true story of a person who invented the steel drums, which are the drums that associated the music that's associated with the West Indies and the Caribbean. So I like bringing these stories to life so that young people get to know a little bit about history. Um, this one here, Simpson and the Donkey, is a story set in World War I. And it's a story of a, a person who was very brave and, and helped soldiers um, back in World War I in a place called Gallipoli, which is a very important place for Australian people. But in this book, of course, um, even though he helped a lot of people, he's also had a lot of friends, including the Sikh gunners. So whilst we've been here and my wife Frana has been talking about the illustrations, a lot of the Indian children who've been looking at this book also see that there's part of their culture and their history hiding away inside this book as well. I live in a, a small town in Australia called Fremantle and many years ago in Fremantle the convict prisoners were brought from England and our town is surrounded by a history and I'd never seen that history before and after a while I started to think that I could write different kind of books, books that would maybe balance history with story. I like to think that um, telling history or learning about history in school for me wasn't something that I was personally interested in. And I thought, how could we tell history and make it enjoyable for children? And I remember that inside the word history is the word story. So if we can turn the things that happened in the past into stories, I think that children learn about the past without kind of thinking that it is a history lesson, it's a story lesson. So I'm trying to strike the balance between telling factual information and also making a riveting story that, that children are keen to keep reading and keep turning the page. I think that basically if you want to learn about a story from World War I um, through school you can learn about the, the dates and the facts and the statistics but to get interested in a story is where the children will actually first take history into their hearts. The balance of writing that sometimes takes many years. Um, one of my books I know took almost 10 years from the time that I had the idea through the, through the research process and the illustration and finding publishers and those sort of things. It takes a long time to weave that and find that right balance. Um, and it's something that I think really what we look for as authors is we first of all find the information and then we try to find a shape for the story so that we can see how the story might find its shape in a children's mind. Because even though I'm interested in these stories and I love the stories, I want to make them interesting for children. And so the balance between what interests me and what will interest a young, a young person is the middle ground that all authors I think are trying to find, especially authors that write about history. My, my books are written for different, various different age groups. 
This one here, I, I would find that it's written for perhaps a, a younger audience than The Greatest Liar on Earth because there is a lot of um, sound effects and things that a lot of children I know like to um, sing along to and make the sound effects. So this audience is probably, uh, I'm not sure in, in India how they divide up schools, but in Australia we have the primary school age goes from um, year one to year seven and year one is around about six years old. So this book would be for year, maybe year age five to age eight, because uh, it's a very young, although there's a reasonable amount of text, the text is very simple and it's very easy to read. Um, the Greatest Liar on Earth is written for an older audience, uh, although, the, although the, um, the story's something that does appeal to young children, the actual text, the story text, uh, is something that is written for a slightly older audience. So this one, for instance, would be probably written for a, what we call middle to upper primary. So we're talking about year age eight to maybe age 14 years old. But as I said, lots of the, in, in Australia, picture books are, are used by all ages. You know, people say being an author is a job, but in fact, it's one of the best jobs you could ever imagine because of the fun that you have doing it. And, and I hope that I do it forever and ever and ever.